evening. Uh, so this is data that was released by the Met Office um, a couple of days ago, and this is looking at the whole of meteorological winter, that's to say December, January and February. And you can see the uh, temperature anomaly um, uh, for, but for, for um, compared with the last um, uh, 30 years, uh, and you can see by the red that uh, we were uh, nearly two degrees um, above the average for the last 30 years. Um, and it's only really in the last few days that we've we've had some frosts. Um, and uh, most significantly of all, um, if you look at the, um, the right-hand side, um, you can see uh, the rainfall. We've had nearly uh, twice uh, the average rainfall uh, that we've had over the last 30 years. So it's not your imagination. It has been an exceptionally wet winter. Um, and I know Dave is going to talk about that uh, later. He's going to talk about how you can take advantage of that. Um, but hopefully, uh, better weather to come uh, over um, the next few weeks. So um, uh, one of the beneficiaries um, of this have been uh, scarlet elf cups. So uh, this is a very distinctive uh, fungus, um, these red, uh, bright red cup-like uh, structures, and they like wet ground. They grow on wood, um, rotting wood, um, but in, in very wet locations, and they have absolutely thrived this winter. Um, I don't think we've ever had as many records uh, for uh, elf cups submitted as we have this winter. Now, there are two possible species. There's the scarlet elf cup and the ruby elf cup. Now, we don't know that the ruby elf cup uh, 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 occurs in Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, but we can't say for sure that it doesn't. Um, and uh, to tell them apart, um, you need a microscope. Some websites will tell you that you can tell them apart by the color of the cups, but that's not really reliable. Um, to tell them apart, you need to look at the microscope. And if you look at the outside of the cup, the hairs on the outside of the cup, the scarlet elf cup has these curly hairs that you can see, whereas the um, ruby elf cup is supposed to have straight hairs but I've never seen a ruby elf cup and I don't know if anybody else here has either. Um, and um, they have these characteristic spores as well, as, uh, uh, the, um, the square ended spores, uh, which line the inside of the, um, the cup. And so um, uh, if you haven't done the microscopy, we record these at genus level, um, sarcocypher. Uh, but if you've done, if you've got a microscope and you've had a go, uh, and you've and you presented that when you've uh, submitted your records, um, uh, um, then by all means uh, we we can record it at species level. So I think scarlet elf cups are probably coming to the end now. Uh, certainly they've been looking a bit tatty recently, but there might still be a few around. So there's the opportunity before it dries out completely to see if you can find any more. Um, as an entomologist, uh, the rain has been a bit of a problem. Uh, the mild weather has been quite good, but the rain has been a real problem. So I've been keeping out of trouble over winter, mostly by uh, uh, um, annoying the ivy um, with um, a beating tray and a stick. When I say beating, uh, people sometimes get the wrong idea. We might say stirring the ivy. Sometimes I use a rubber glove and a stick um, and we see what falls out of the ivy. And um, uh, it's surprising what falls out of the ivy. But you need you do need the right kind of ivy. You need um, the these young leaves, these young triangular leaves that look like this, preferably in a nice thick coating uh, against a solid object like a tree trunk or a wall. The arboreal ivy, where the leaves have a, have a different shape, um, that waves in the wind, doesn't really offer much in the way of shelter, either to frost or wind or rain uh, so it, it's the it's the thick stuff up against a wall or a, a tree trunk which is which is good and um, we found a lot of stuff in ivy over the last few months so this is just a quick summary of some of the things that I've found by no means all of them um, hawthorn shield bug has been very numerous um, over the winter very attractive shield bug um, and uh, this is the one I seem to have found um, in the ivy uh, most frequently. 
Um, the um, the next one on the right uh, doesn't have a common name, I'm afraid. Um, Issus coleopterus. Um, uh, this is actually a nymph. We don't get the adults of this uh, at this time of year, um, but um, you can find this in ivy pretty much everywhere you look. And we don't have very many records for this um, uh, because it is quite small. It's only uh, a couple of millimeters long. The, the adults can be up to about four millimeters long, but they will appear uh, later in the spring and over the summer. So I think this is underrecorded just because it's quite small and maybe people don't spend as much time peering at, as, at ivy as I do. Um, but this is really a very spectacular looking thing. This looks like some kind of dinosaur um, or alien creation. I think they're fantastic. Um, the other thing that hides in the ivy is the birch catkin bug. While there aren't any birch catkins over the winter, um, it's uh, sheltered, hunkering down, overwintering. Surprising how many insects actually do overwinter as adults if they can find somewhere uh, sheltered and preferably frost free. Um, and, and you find lots of these anywhere. Um, you don't have to be particularly close to birch trees, but they're, they're very common, um, about uh, three to four millimeters long. And, and quite small, only two to three millimeters long, is this strange thing on the bottom right. This is a uh, viburnum cushion scale, which is a scale insect. Um, this is actually the, 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 the larval form, the nymph of the scale insect. Uh, later in the spring, the scale insect, uh, the, these will turn into adult scale insects, which are little tiny yellow things, couple of two to three millimeters long. Um, but you don't actually see the adults very much. They cover themselves in a in a fuzzy, waxy coating, um, and um, uh, um, uh, that they, they protect themselves that way. Now, um, uh, the, these little tiny scales, you do have to look quite closely at the backs of ivy leaves. Although it's called viburnum cushion scale, um, it doesn't just affect viburnum; it uh, affects uh, quite a number of different plants. Um, I found it on Fatsia in my garden um, and certainly ivy. It seems to be um, basically if you look at ivy, wherever you go, you can find it. So it's incredibly common and again, uh, uh, very, very under recorded. Again, probably because it's small and probably because we don't pay ivy enough attention. Such a fabulous wildlife plant, um, ivy, home to such a range of things. Obviously, birds will be building nests in ivy. Uh, in the next few weeks, but there's, there's been a lot of life going on there in the winter. And the other thing that's entertained me particularly um, over the last few weeks are the ladybirds that I have found um, in, uh, in ivy. And you do find quite a lot of ladybirds. Almost all our ladybirds overwinter as adults if they can find somewhere nice and sheltered. And um, ivy does the trick. Um, so um, the ones you might know, uh, the seven spot ladybird and the harlequin ladybird you're probably familiar with. Uh, the harlequin ladybird's a bit of a trickster. They can be difficult to tell apart. There's lots of photographs on that species page on Nature Spot to help you recognize the different patterns and colors that they can have. Uh, you also find a few two spot ladybirds. Now the two spot ladybird is an interesting one uh, because it is declining nationally. Um, there, there, there are several new ladybirds which have recently appeared in the country. I say, I say new within the last 10 or 15 years and appear to be spreading rapidly. But there are also species which seem to be declining. And the two spot ladybird uh, is one of those. So you might be very familiar with the two spot ladybird, um, uh, but we really do want records of that. Um, because, um, it, you know, it, it's, I think it's important to document whether this whether species are going up or coming down. And then moving down to the bottom row, we have the ivy ladybird, um, uh, which um, is quite small. So I, 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 uh, as a suitable scale object, I hope it's a, a suitable scale object, um, is this this very finger that I am showing to you now. I'll, 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 I won't hold it right up to the camera because it looks, or if I hold it back here, you can see that the actual ladybird is pretty small, about three millimeters long, something like that. Beautifully marked, attractive uh, ladybird. 
Now, we divide ladybirds into two main groups. We have the so-called conspicuous ladybirds, so things like the seven-spot ladybird and the harlequin, and then the inconspicuous ladybirds, uh, of which there are quite a number. So we've got nearly 50 species in total in the UK. We don't get all of those in Leicestershire, uh, but we get most of them. Um, and these little conspicuous ladybirds, we have few records for because people over overlook them. They're very small and they're almost all quite hairy like this. And the other one that you find very commonly in ivy is, is this ladybird, which is called the epaulette ladybird, based on the, the, the patterns on its uh, wing cases, uh, elytra. Um, if you'd asked us, say, five years ago, um, we would have said that this is um, a rare ladybird. Um, actually, now when I go out, when I look in ivy, I can find it pretty much everywhere I look. It's also on, on conifers and all sorts of different evergreens over the winter. So um, I, I think this probably is one that's increasing in frequency, uh, but it, I'm sure it's also the case that people just haven't looked for it um, in the past. So um, ladybird recording, ladybirds are around all year long. Uh, we'll, we will be it come sort of April, May, depending on what the weather's like. You'll be seeing eggs and larvae as well. Uh, but the adults are around pretty much the whole year. So ladybirds have been very entertaining for me. Uh, you do find spiders, lots of spiders uh, in the ivy. And some of you know that I'm interested in spiders. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the spiders that you find in ivy over the winter are immature and I can tell you what family they're in but I couldn't tell you what species they are until they become uh, adults uh, because you just can't tell them apart until that stage um, but these two are very very distinctive spiders um, and um, uh, you find them quite a lot in ivy not just in ivy you find them in other evergreens as well but you do often find them sheltering over the winter so one is a crab spider Daia dorsata very distinctive uh, spider I always think this one's lime flavored I don't go around tasting them uh, but I suspect it would be lime flavored if you uh, if you did eat it um, and uh, Nygma vulcanari uh, doesn't have a common neither of these have common names um, uh, um, this is a spider which is relatively new uh, to the county. We've only had it for uh, about 10 years. Uh, does seem to be increasing in frequency. Uh, my bet is if you've got a garden, you've probably got this in your garden because it's one of the species that's spreading uh, very rapidly. So um, another one to look out for. So that was my look backwards. Dave, Dave's going to tell you what he's been up to uh, shortly. Um, uh, uh, but I thought I would look forward to the next few weeks as well. Some of the things that you can be looking out for. Um, uh, one is uh, um, uh, 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 this species, the hairy footed flower bee, really a very distinctive uh, solitary bee. Um, uh, um, uh, I saw the first two. Um, in uh, my garden yesterday, um, they're 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 quite distinctive when they fly. And I was sitting indoors looking out the window, and I looked and I saw and I thought I knew immediately what it was. Um, the hairy feet are, of course, very very distinctive. Um, that I I found uh, when when it's cold and windy like it was yesterday, they like daffodils. They get right down in the trumpet of the daffodil, and I'm guessing they probably have a bit of a warm up in the daffodil so they can fly off somewhere else. Um, but you'll be seeing those appearing in uh, the next few weeks, and then looking slightly further ahead. Um, to uh, maybe um, uh, maybe maybe the start of April, maybe the end of March, um, the bee flies will be um, appearing. And uh, these again are very distinctive um, uh, species. And until about three years ago, we had one species in Leicestershire and Rutland, so that was very easy. We had the dark edged bee fly um, on the left. Now, when it's flying, um, it's difficult to see the wings. It, it, the wings beat very fast. It, it looks like a little tiny furry hum hummingbird uh, when it's flying. Um, I, I mean, it does look something like a bee um, as well. It's bee sized. 
Um, uh, but it's again quite a distinctive insect. It does hover over flowers uh, and you'll recognize it. But even when it's flying, you can see this distinctive, very long proboscis, which it uses to uh, drink nectar from uh, flowers. Um, you need it to be perched really to see the dark edges on the wings. But as of a couple of years ago, uh, we now have a second species um, in the county, which has been spreading uh, northwards. We have the dotted bee fly. Uh, and as you can see from this one, uh, the, the wings have these distinctive dots. I haven't seen this one yet, but um, I think we can be confident that it's increasing in frequency. Um, there, there are a number of other species of bee fly in the UK, but these, these are the two that have reached us so far. Um, uh, it, it's well worth looking at for a dotted bee fly because we would still regard that as quite a rare insect at the present time. Um, but they, they might want it to um, warm up a bit. Uh, so maybe uh, towards the end of this month or April, uh, take a look out for bee flies. Right, that's enough from me. Now, Dave, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do your section next or... Um, uh, or, or shall I go on with the questions we've had sent in? What do you think? Um, well, sh shall I do my bit and then yes. we can kind of open it up and um, Absolutely. have more of a chat, I think. OK, if you want to put your slides up. I always um, struggle to find the uh, the the slide view option because it gets covered up. <laughs> yeah, I think they've moved everything around on Zoom as well. Um, I think there's. OK, I can try it that That's way. One. That looks good. Yeah. OK, so, yes, carry on with the weather theme. Um, it's very tempting, isn't it, when it's kind of wet and raining and everywhere's very muddy, just to stay indoors and assume that there's no wildlife to be seen. But uh, I've realised, and I'm not the only one to have discovered this, is that uh, there's a great opportunity uh, if you go exploring flood debris. And there's two particular groups of animals that I think you, you can have a, a, a bit of a gold mine with, um, if you go through flood debris, I know, you know, it, it's not necessarily the most attractive thing, uh, depending where you go, but um, it's an amazing habitat. And I suppose if you think about it, for a lot of uh, terrestrial insects, when the water level rises, they if they're going to survive, they have to uh, find somewhere to kind of uh, escape. So they will tend to kind of climb up anywhere where there's vegetation and often that's where you get an accumulation of, of debris falling as well. But in addition, the, the floodwaters themselves um, will sweep uh, a number of, of, of things, and, and, and in particular, the, the shells of, of, of snails. And if you find the right place, they kind of gather in quite significant accumulations. So whenever I see these kind of habitats, I always kind of, go and have a look these days. And uh, I, I find them really quite rich places to, to find wildlife and often wildlife that you wouldn't otherwise see. So this was a, a small example. Uh, I was at Watermead Country Park uh, a little while ago, and there was an area where there seemed to be a particular uh, rich composition of shells. As you can see, not just shells, but mixed up with bits of of, of wood and, and vegetation. So I literally just put, collected a small pot full and took them home and put them under the microscope uh, to see what was there. And literally in that very small cup full that you can see there, I found all of these species. Um, interestingly, they're not all aquatic species. The ones in green are terrestrial snails. And I suppose if you think about it, it's not surprising that when the floodwaters come up, uh, a lot of things get drowned. And that's, I think, largely what's happened to, uh, to, to these terrestrial snails. But then the shells get washed with all of the other debris 
and get filtered out in the in the in the in the flood debris, particularly in in, in these kind of higher uh, areas that act like a filter. So as the water flows through, it catches the snails. So actually, it's it's great fun going going through the debris. It's not just um, snails as well that you find. Uh, there's all sorts of things in there, um, you know, beetles and bugs and, and worms and, and, and all sorts of things. And indeed, in quite a few of the empty snail shells, you find other creatures that use the snail shell as a habitat. There's a few beetles that, uh, that, that, that breed in them, but also there's a few uh, spiders that uh, use empty snail shells as a habitat. So I just thought it might be interesting just to have a look at one or two um, of the finds. One species which is quite large is the is the common river snail. It's the size of the um, the, the white lipped or the brown lipped snail that you find on land. This is a peer species. Um, it's fairly easy to recognise. Um, has these uh, kind of dull red stripes around it. Even quite old shells tend to retain those stripes. And, and this kind of turreting uh, spiral form. Unfortunately, it's very hard to see a live animal. I mean, they're common enough. They're, they're in the canals, the rivers, in the lakes. They're, they're fairly widespread. But uh, unless you go snorkeling, uh, you're not likely to see one like this. So I, I, I like this picture to just give you an idea of what it must look like if, if you did find a, a live one. Like a lot of uh, aquatic snails, they have what's called an operculum, a kind of a trap door that they can kind of pull their body into the shell and then they close the door uh, as a protective mechanism. So it's, a, a, I suppose, a shell extension. If you see the live animal crawling around, the, uh, the, the, the operculum, the lid, is attached to the body and it, it just kind of like wafts around at the side of the, the body. So there's only really aquatic snails that have this um, adaptation. I think in pretty much all of the terrestrial snails it's been lost. I suppose if you're crawling around on land um, it becomes a, you know, a, a bit of a disadvantage. You get it caught on things, it would prevent you from kind of getting into tight spaces. Because when you find the snail shells you they've normally lost the perculum. So you don't always or often find them together. But if you just look around, you will find the perculum uh, on their own. So something else to look out for. One um, ID tip when, you, when you're looking at shells is if it is a snail with an operculum, it has to have um, a, a shape, an opening that is very level and, and, and smooth rimmed in order that the, the lid will fit neatly and form a good seal. So if you find that the, the, the edge of the mouth kind of fades into the shell, chances are it's not one of the species within the perculum. So sometimes that's a useful way of separating out the species. So one or two other things that I found um, included this. I've only ever seen this uh, along the river saw. Um, it's actually a, a non-native species, but it has been around for 150 years plus. Um, as the, the name suggests, the American bladder snail, it, it, it was introduced from America. Um, and it was originally, I think it utilised the canals to spread across the country, but now it, it's taken over rivers and it, it's found in a number of different areas. But what's interesting about the bladder snails is that they're left-handed or left world. So if you look at this shell, you'll see the, the mouth, the opening is on the left hand side. So just compare that to the standard snail, um, as illustrated here, where the mouth opening is on the right hand side. There are very few snails that have the opening on the left. So it's just a giveaway. If you find uh, in, in, in Leicestershire and Rutland, a snail with the, the, the mouth opening on the left, you know you've got one of the bladder snails. There are three species. They're about um, five to seven mil, um, most of them, although they, the, the, the American bladder snail can grow uh, a good bit bigger, but commonly it's, it's five to seven mil. But they're quite distinctive shapes. So the combination of the, the, the left-hand side opening 
and the the roundness or the pointedness of the spire uh, gives you kind of a good a good guide to to tell you which species you've got. Occasionally, you come across uh, shells of some of our biggest mollusks in the county. These are the the mussels, um, the aquatic mussels, and we have two species that grow to quite a size: uh, the swan mussel and the duck mussel. Both of them can grow to the the size of your hand, um, quite significant uh, in, in size, and they can be quite tricky to tell apart. the The swan mussel on the left is more elongate. And if you can imagine uh, drawing a line along the base of the shell there, then the, the top of the shell is almost parallel, not quite, but almost, and compare that to the duck muscle, the bottom right, much more rounded, and um, the, the slope at the top is much more angled. But you know, frustratingly, as is the case with a lot of species, there are uh, intermediates that, that can get tricky. So there is another little clue. If you look on the inside of the shell, the big muscle uh, that holds the two shells together in a bivalve, the adductor muscle, um, will have, if you found the shell, then chances are there, there'll be nothing left of the animal itself, nor the muscles, but it leaves a scar on the inside of the shell. And you can often very clearly see the outline of this, this scar. And if it, Basically, there's two muscles on, on the duck muscle, they merge into one scar, and on the swan muscle, they do join, but only just. So there's a, a small neck that attaches them. But it's not just um, shells and snails that uh, you can find. One of the uh, kind of exciting things to, to go looking for uh, when, when there's been a flood uh, are beetles. And there are a lot of kind of aquatic beetles that would normally live in the vegetation or on the mud around the edges of, of waterways, which are quite tricky to find. Um, you can't easily kind of get in and they just scurry away if they, if they sense you're coming. But when it's flooded, as I mentioned earlier, they will seek ways of escaping and they will climb um, onto vegetation. You, you, you do find them in the, in the debris that we just looked at, but perhaps more commonly you find them um, under the bark of, 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 kind of dead uh, branches, either that are on the ground or on a, on a tree. So uh, I've been kind of catching quite a lot of beetles of late. So these are just few that I found in the last uh, month or so. This one uh, at the bottom left, uh, uh, Opsips cephalus obscurus, I've never seen before. And it, it seems to be like the commonest uh, beetle that I've, I've come across this year. Every uh, flooded area I've been to and, and searched amongst uh, logs and, and, and peeled under the bark, I found it in good numbers. Um, the other one, uh, they're all kind of, these are all ground beetles. Um, the, the agonum uh, species are nearly always associated with wetland areas, but they as I say, a bit tricky to find um, during the summer. But they like a lot of the ground beetles, they are they were a decent size, but they don't have necessarily a lot of bright colours or key features. So you have to look for more kind of subtle clues. And the uh, pronotum on the beetle, the, the middle bit behind the head, on the uh, agonum species is very rounded and kind of tapers as, as, as this one uh, illustrates. But the other week I was... Um, on the river saw next to Cossington, and there was um, a big willow tree next to the river, and it had a kind of branch about chest high that was uh, a lot of peeling bark on it. And so I lifted up the bark, and uh, I was amazed to see about four or five of these very large carabus beetles, a species I'd never seen before. Really spectacular, it's quite exciting. Um, and amongst them, you know, there, there were a range of colors. They, some of them had this kind of green metallic sheen and then some more bronzy tones in them and some of them had this kind of reddish color so i was i was i was really kind of quite excited to 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 find this and i, I read afterwards it's the kind of species that despite its size um it's very hard to see other 
than searching through flood debris or under bark in, in, in and around flooded areas. So I know the weather's getting better now, but um, there's still quite a lot of flood debris around. And, you know, if, if you're out and see some, do have a, a nosy around. You, you can add quite a lot of species that you wouldn't otherwise see. OK, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> that was good. Um, uh, we, we, we will have a discussion later on. I mean, uh, feel free to ask questions if you want in the uh, chat window. I don't know if anybody wants to ask anything before we move on um, based on what Dave has said and what I said. So if not, then uh, I guess we'll we'll move on. We've had two questions sent in, uh, so uh, maybe we can take a look at those. Dave hasn't seen these, so uh, one of them is a question for Dave, but he doesn't know that yet. So uh, we'll <laughs> test him, shall we, uh, and see how good he is. Um, so um, uh, thanks to Christine for sending in a couple of questions. Um, the first one uh, is a worm. Uh, Christine found a worm and uh, having, you know, kept got the ruler out of his her pocket, as you do when you're out and about, uh, she measured it and it was 22 centimetres long. Uh, and it's not it's not been stretched to breaking point. So, you know, it's a pretty big worm. Uh, I'm not quite sure um, uh, what kind of uh, worm it is, but Dave is our worm expert, so he will um, uh, um, uh, tell you later. Um, uh, I, I um, not a worm expert either. So um, I did the obvious thing and I Googled it um, and I found Dave the Worm. Sorry, sorry, Dave, it wasn't me that called it Dave the Worm. Uh, so this is from the uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, Dave the Giant Worm uh, is uh, 40 centimetres long, was actually measured by the Natural History Museum. Um, so 22 centimetres is a good worm um uh, and, and a noted worm uh but not a record breaker i'm afraid christine um uh, i'm i'm guessing i'm gonna test go out on a limb here and see what our worm expert says i'm guessing these are lumbricus terrestris dave yeah i i, I think so I'm, I'm not sure i'm comfortable being called a worm expert and certainly not You're something i'd expert. like you to share in public please <laughs> <laughs> Have um, you ever seen a 40 centimetre long worm? <laughs> no, no, I haven't. Have you seen a 22 centimetre uh, long worm? Well, I've seen some big ones. I think uh, Lumbricus terrestris is the uh, British biggest British species we have. Um, so it's highly likely to be that. It is actually surprisingly tricky to identify worms. And the, uh, the, the Earthworm Society takes a very strict uh rule uh book to to uh, and applies them to to records um you have to kind of key them out which largely means killing the worm yeah the, the key is based on uh counting the segments of the worm the number of segments before you come to the clitellum which is the um the the, the thickening um on, yeah which, sometimes called the saddle i believe yeah yeah which um so, so the number of segments before that, um, and then the, uh, the clitellum also has a kind of number of pores in it. So you have to look at the pores. And then another feature to look at is uh, you might think of worms as being completely smooth and slippery, which, well, they are in our hands, but actually they have some minute bristles, um, which you can only really see under the microscope, and it helps them. Uh, anchor themselves within their burrows and, and 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 to move around and so it's the number and positioning of those bristles that is another id feature so yeah it's kind of hard work <laughs> identifying um, worm species but um yeah a, a, a good guess would be lumbricus terrestris for, for christine's giant worm we don't have a record from the Natural History Museum of what happened to Dave, unfortunately. We don't know whether he was put back in the ground or whether he's now pickled in uh, in South Kensington. Uh, they didn't record that. So, um, not, well, nice find, um, uh, Christine, but not a record breaker, I'm afraid. 
Um, the second question that Christine asked um, was about this. She found these um, on uh, a tree trump uh, in uh, February, or tree stump rather, uh, in February, and and um, she wondered um, if they were um, some sort of wasp um, cases or homes. Um, they're not, because um, uh, I know the answer to this one, um, uh, um, and I'm not a wasp expert. Um, the reason I know the answer to this, one, I was hoping our, our mammal expert would be with us this evening, but she's not here. Um, but um, uh, the reason I know the expert, is, uh, the reason I know the answer is because um, uh, the wood mice in my garden uh, filled our previous garden shed with uh, kernels um, uh, of plum stones, which I think are, are, are what these are, um, or, or they, they could be damsons, they could be plums, something along that line. Um, and um, uh, we, they, they almost literally filled our shed with them. Uh, we have we now have a new, um, slightly more um, wood mouse proof shed. So um, I, I think so. What you've stumbled across here is um, I think is a, is a, is a rodent food hoard. Um, and um, I know uh, I don't know if we do have any mammal experts tonight. Um, but um, I know that um, uh, if you look carefully at the shells, at the way that they've been chewed, you can work out um, which uh, species of mammal it is. Um, we do have uh, now in, uh, in northwest Leicestershire, just, we have hazel dormice, um, but I don't think these are likely to be hazel dormice. Um, uh, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm not enough of a mammal expert, a rodent expert to say exactly which, uh, but my guess would be wood mice, wood mouse, because it looked very much like the, the wood mouse horde uh, that, that I've seen before. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to add any more to that. Dave, are you, are you familiar with these or? Um, well, yeah, they, they, well, they look like wood mice gnawing. Um... They kind of create this fairly neat hole, but you can see the teeth marks or the chisel marks, um, whereas some species create a much smoother uh, hole. Um, how, do you, how do you tell a, whether it's a wood mouse or a squirrel? Um, I think you probably could if you if if you had a closer look at it. You know, from this from the size of the the teeth marks on them. You know, a, a squirrel would have bigger teeth, of course. Mm. Um, I noticed Sally's just put um, a comment on that uh, she thinks they're slow um, kernels, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, as opposed to plums, slow. Yeah. which I suppose would make more sense if it, if yeah. it's out in the countryside. But yeah, as you say, if Helen was here, she might she might be able to recognise them. But did I think you, to, to be sure, you'd need to to know the scale. Yeah. Did did, did you collect any, Christine? I, I didn't know. No, oh, and they well. were in the arboretum, Attenborough Arboretum. Well, if they're if they're still there, uh, if you can pick one or two up and get some uh, close up photographs, um, I'm I'm sure our mammal expert will will be able to tell you uh, what they are probably. So, okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, nice find. Uh, as yeah, I say, the reason the, the reason I knew instantly what that was is I've had a garden shed full of them in the past. <laughs> 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 they they are quite wood mice are quite spectacular um uh, for hoarding uh food supplies and and who can blame them uh when it's winter yeah i've had them in flower pots yes yeah they'll, they'll find somewhere out of the way they, they go under our garden furniture as well and stash food under there as well um so um those are the questions we've got sent in um i i don't i don't know if anybody else wants to um ask anything or has made any unusual observations just 